Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you, and I'm super excited to start this Sunday series uh, on living life missionally. I, 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 I don't, when I plan out and calendar my schedule, I, I always end up scheduling my preaching days on Sunday right in the, the end of the semester when everyone's tired. But anyway, um, I need to be more thoughtful in the future. But um, what, what I'm really hoping for with this Missional Life series is that we could do something similar to in this series as we do with the Lament series. And part of my hope and vision is actually for the Lament series and the Missional Life series to go back to back uh, every year, right around Lent season and this month uh, following uh, Lent. And uh, part of the reason uh, behind this is, uh, is this. When I think of spiritual formation, when I think of our journey of becoming formed, of, of Christ forming us more and more into his likeness, I think of a process of formation that is holistic, right? I think of a process that involves not only our exterior life, but also our interior life as well. You know, in generations past, I believe that a lot of our Christian communities have had a history of overemphasizing the formation of our exterior life and underemphasizing the interior life, where we had received messages growing up in church like, uh, you have to do this, you have to do that, whether this involves uh, showing up to Sunday's morning, giving money, serving at church, reading the Bible, practicing prayer, etc., etc. And the reason that was given to us to do all these things is just simply because that's what good Christians do, right? Like, I grew up receiving all those messages but no one really explained to me why I was supposed to do that, aside from this idea that good Christians are supposed to do that, and we don't want to be not a good Christian. And we didn't really notice that people were actually doing this behavior out of guilt or shame or because they're trying to, to win other people's approval, right? And all along, they've never really understood the purpose of doing all these things, perhaps beyond you know, benefiting some sort of religious institution or religious you know, community that some leader is trying to build, right? And that's one of the many reasons why it's important for us to pay attention to the formation of the interior life as well. We need to care and shepherd for those immaterial parts of ourselves. Just as we care and shepherd for our physical bodies, we need to care for things like our emotions, our minds, our thoughts, our hearts, our motivations, our relationships, our relational dispositions, all that good stuff that God also created in us. And this is why our church values things like soul care and spiritual formation. It's also why I exist as the pastor of spiritual formation at our church. But speaking now as a psychologist, I also want to confess that those of us who spend most of our time helping people working on their interior life, that we can also find ourselves overcompensating like the generation before us, where we can begin to focus almost exclusively on just the interior life without paying much attention to the exterior life, where our only goal and where our ultimate goal is the cultivation of things like inner peace and comfort, or even other good things like self-knowledge or self-awareness or inner wholeness. And what I'd like to suggest to you this morning is that while all these goals are good and true, they're still good, they're still true. I would like to suggest that they, that they cannot be the ultimate goal of the Christian life, right? The ultimate goal of the Christian life cannot be just inner peace or self-awareness. Let's say that I've made progress in these things, right? Let's say that I've come to know myself. Let's say that I've come to learn how to uh, cope emotionally with difficult situations and difficult emotions and difficult circumstances. And now I am actually reaching a place of deeper inner wholeness. The question I want to raise to you is, well, say you reach that point, is that it? Now what? Right? And similarly, thinking of last week as we just finished Easter Sunday, now that we have grieved during Good Friday, through this season of Lent, now that the Lord has joined and held our grief, now that we have held each other's grief, and we're going to continue to do that even beyond this season of Lent. And now that we have celebrated Christ's resurrection from the dead and his conquering of sin and darkness, we go back to the same question. Is that it? Now what? How would you answer 
this question. What do we do? How are we to be now? What I'd like to do this morning is start a conversation about how we might begin to answer this question by sharing with you uh, this threefold process of formation that I've learned from my uh, Roman Catholic uh, brothers and sisters who have thought and taught this for centuries. And the threefold process of formation goes something like this, and I think this is drawn straight from St. Francis of Assisi. It is self-knowledge, self-acceptance, and then self-gift. First, let's start with self-knowledge. Self-knowledge asks the question, do you know yourself? Do you know your personality? Do you know your thinking patterns? Do you know your inclinations? Do you know your emotions? Do you know your life history? I know we all have, a lot, many of us have really difficult life histories. Do you know these things so that you can more thoroughly know and understand who you are today? I know Meg does special consultations and trainings on the Enneagram. And a lot of people, everyone I know that's been part of that has said it's been fantastic. And I think that this kind of work is so helpful for the spiritual life because it enhances this kind of thing. It enhances our capacity to know ourselves and our inclinations. But self-knowledge is actually just the first step. It's not the final step. Once we attain to some self-knowledge, the next step is self-acceptance. And this, is, this can be a very difficult step. Self-acceptance self asks us a different question. It asks us the question, can I look at myself without denying or pushing away the reality, all of the reality that I see. You know, it's really easy for us to accept those parts of ourselves that are positive, that are part of our strengths, that speak well of us. But when we begin to observe those other parts of ourselves, right, those that are vulnerable, unhealthy, embarrassing, maybe even shameful, it can be really tempting for us to engage in denial, to kind of push it away, to minimize it, or even to pretend that it's not there, and to say to ourselves, that, that, that can't be me. I'm, I'm a different person. I'm more mature than that. That just simply cannot be me, right? And instead, what self-acceptance says is this, that I'm willing to face this uncomfortable reality of who I am in its totality, and that I'm to, willing to, uh, to acknowledge that this other side of me exists as well. And friends, this is a crucial, difficult step in the stage of meaning, any kind of meaningful change in one's life. Because this stage, this step has to happen before we can bring our, our ugliness, our, our brokenness before the Lord to ask him to redeem and to transform the, those parts of us. And, but we can have the courage to face who we are because God loves us unconditionally. And as important as self-knowledge is, as important as self-acceptance might be, the process doesn't end with self-acceptance. For after we know ourselves, after we have come to acknowledge who we are, not only the pleasant and redeeming parts, but also the not-so-comfortable parts, there's one more step. And that step that I'd love to talk more today and in this coming series and hopefully in future years is the final self, which is self-gift. Once we can take ownership of who we are, our Christian life teaches us that we are to give it away, right? We're not supposed to own who we are just so that we can say, hey, I have a self and it's healthy. We are to have a self so that we can give it away. We can have a self to give, to give to the Lord, to give to each other, and to give to the world. John chapter 15 Verse 13 says this. Greater love has yeah, greater love has no one than this. That someone lay down his life for his friends. Friends, this is just another way of saying self-gift. This is what self-gift is all about. And similarly, when Jesus has, was asked about the greatest commandment in the law in Matthew 22, he replied by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This 
is the essence of self-gift. It is a giving of ourselves to God first and foremost, and the giving of ourselves to our neighbor and to our world. And the greatest gift that we can give to God is not our money or our time or even our skills. The greatest gift that we can give to God and the world is the gift of ourselves. The gift of our true self, not the gift of our false self. Right? And the more we know ourselves, the more we are able to accept all of ourselves, the more we are able to give our true selves to the Lord and to each other. Self-gift is love embodied. Friends, I've been studying and doing research on spiritual formation for the last 20 years. And I didn't learn about the three selves until very recently. Right? Self-knowledge, self-acceptance, self-gift. And now that I've learned it, this is how I integrate all of the work that I do. Right? This is how I integrate my spiritual life, my personal life, my professional life, so on and so forth. God has called me to heal emotional wounds, to help people become whole, to help people know themselves, to accept themselves, so that they could be more fully formed in their true self into the likeness of Christ, so that, and this is the key, they can give themselves more fully to the Lord and to, the, uh, and to each other and to the world. And friends, I am still on this journey of knowing myself, of accepting myself, and also of giving myself away. You know, many of us probably are familiar with stories when we were younger and a lot more immature. And I'm still immature. Um, you can just ask my wife. <laughs> and when we were a lot more immature than we are today, a lot of us might have had great passion to give ourselves to God, to give ourselves to address the injustices of the world. But we've also seen stories of people with this great passion who didn't know themselves very well, right? who didn't accept themselves, who thought that they were, they were someone different, who perhaps idealized themselves and thought that they were someone different than they actually were. And as a result, their capacity to actually give themselves to the world and to the Lord was actually quite compromised, filled with imperfection. Good intention, but a lot of imperfection. And so much so that perhaps at times, we, not just they, we, ended up causing more harm than good. Right? Because our self-gift our self -gift was so, so imperfect and so immature. Friends, I, I can talk about this all day. right? And as a professor, I'm constantly reminded that um, I, I overload people with content. And so, so what I want to do is just pause for a few moments and invite you to, uh, to reflect you know, if you're comfortable doing this, I know a lot of times uh, Pastor Wayne gets a lot of complaints because he wants conversations and it might make people feel uncomfortable. So if you fall into that category, just treat this time as a time for self-reflection. Don't feel like you need to talk to anyone. But if you're comfortable, you can talk to someone next to you. And I'd like for you to just share your reactions. This is the first time you've heard of the three selves. And what are your reactions to this? Let's just talk for a few moments and we'll continue. Go ahead. Okay, everyone, let's come back together. <laughs> let's come back together. Some great conversations, some great conversations. And those of you joining us through Zoom, feel free to join in through the chat. We'd love to get your sense and your reflections as well. And I hope that this, this kind of three selves framework that you found it somewhat helpful. Certainly don't feel like you have to you know, agree or, uh, with everything that I shared, but at the very least, I'm hoping that this conversation can encourage us to think more deeply about how to live the Christian life more purposely, how to locate the various things that we're trying to do at our church, whether it's lament or soul care or peacemaking, and how they all might are pieces that fit into this larger picture of how we, as One Life City Church, do discipleship and live out our mission. Because we are, what we're, our efforts are to, uh, we're trying to do is that we're trying to cultivate wholeness, not only individually, but wholeness in our church, so that we as an entire church can give ourselves more fully to the Lord and to the suffering of the world. And so the vision and purpose of this teaching series on the missional life, I think it's fair to say, is for us to focus on and flesh out what self-gift actually looks like in real life. Because... This is not a cookie cutter thing. Every one of us has our own unique callings and giftings and vocations 
so the way we go about living out self-gift is going to look really different from person uh, to person. And we're not going to just talk about the theory or concept of self-gift. We want to invite community members in the next three weeks to share their experiences, to share their wisdom, to share even their failures along the way um, on how they have pursued self-gift in their life. And uh, we also want to provide opportunities for us to practice self-gift more deeply with each other as well. So in fact, I'm really excited about next week. We're actually going to invite Marcos and Bernice to come and share <laughs> from their journey and how they've practiced self-gift. And we're going to learn from their decades of service to the Lord and to the world through different contexts at church, at work, and family, in their personal lives. I think we're going to have a ton to learn from our dear brother and sister. The week after, we're going to have another uh, newer member of our community, Peter Chung, who's going to speak on marketplace theology. <laughs> and I'm really excited about marketplace theology. It's a whole kind of uh, unique domain that is still new and still fresh and still growing. And the idea behind marketplace theology is the question of how do I practice self-gift in the marketplace? How do I practice self-gift at work. And then a week after that, we'll be inviting Jasmine, Martha, and Ella Ramirez. So the whole Ramirez family is going to pretty much be here in this next month. <laughs> and we're going to invite them to share about the practice of self-gift as we are present in our neighborhood. So we have a really exciting lineup of, of speakers and perspectives in the weeks to come. And you know, one of the values that is so important to our church is the value of affirming the sacredness in all of our work, in all of our careers, in all of our vocations. There's no hierarchy of you know, one vocation or one career being better or more godly than another. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So this raises an interesting question. We come to church on Sundays, but what does it mean for us to live for Christ during the other six days of the week? How do we practice self-gift during all seven days of our week? And the point that I want to try, drive home today, this morning, and in this series and in future years to come in our church is this. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary or work in a nonprofit to live out this principle in Scripture every day of your life. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary or a nonprofit worker to live on mission for the kingdom of God because we're all called to live life missionally. Everyone, no matter what we do for a living, right? The kingdom of God does not follow this arrangement where there's only a few of us that are living missionally and the rest of us are just working regular jobs so that we can give them money and support their agenda. And, you know, so this is like, you know, Pastor Elliot's church or Pastor Jay's church, and we're just supporting them, creating their church. This is all of our church, and we're all to practice self-gift. This is all of our spiritual calling. And this is one of the many things that I, I love about our church, and I hope we're modeling well, is that we're a participatory church. We value incorporating as many voices, as many gifts as we can into the life of the church. And along similar lines, my hope is that we can also value the sacredness of all work, the sacredness of all jobs, blue collar, white collar, everything in between, different careers, different vocations. And we as a church, we want to equip and support and encourage all of us to engage in the missional Christian life, no matter what we do in the middle of the week. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13 explains. So Christ gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the whole body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Allow me to rephrase this passage a little bit to convey my heart for this church. So Christ himself gave all the teachers, the property management staff, engineers, business owners, administrative staff, nonprofit staff, counselors, accountants, medical professionals, mothers, fathers, and students to equip his people for works of service so that the whole body of Christ can be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Friends, we need all of us to work together 
to accompany each other, to serve each other, to support each other, and most importantly, to lead each other if we are to equip the full body of Christ so that we can reach, all reach unity in the faith and knowledge and become mature. We want all of us to grow together, all of us to reach maturity together. And as I begin to land the plane of today's message this morning, the way I want to do this is by charting out a vision, charting out some future directions on where we might be going, not only in the next few weeks, but also in the next several years as we revisit this series on the missional life. And to this end, I want to leave, with, leave you with five teaching points that I hope to revisit in more detail in the future. That's another annoying thing that Pastor Dave does. He always kind of drops some bombs at the end and then promises he's going to go back, but he doesn't usually go back into it until maybe 12 months later. So I'm going to do that again, but I'm going to multiply it by five. <laughs> so um, maybe we'll go through the, all, each of these in the next five years. Okay. <laughs> Lord willing. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to unpack them much, but let me just kind of drop this with you. First, be, because God is sovereign over all of life, your life, including your work life, is ordained by God, and it's significant. Number two, God's sovereignty works in a way where there are many things you can do for God's glory, not just one. You know, a lot of us get stuck in this idea of like, I can only serve God and give of glory if I do this, and I'm stuck on this one way, and we, we, we kind of hold on to it super rigidly. I don't think that's true. I think there's many different ways we can serve God. It doesn't have to be only one. Right? Number three, the only real mistake we can make is to not want to do God's will, to not want to glorify God where you are at right now. Fourth, the very worst that can happen to you in your career can actually turn out to be God's training for something more. That has certainly been the case in my life as well. I think I'm even living it right now. And number five, in whatever job, career, or vocation you find yourself in, you are called to walk by faith rather than by sight. So living out in faith in your work is not reserved just for pastors and missionaries. It's for all of us. All of us have to do it. And we, but in fact, I think it's harder for us to do it for those of us who aren't pastors and missionaries because there's not as much guidance and not as much support to do this. But we're actually all called to do it anyway. So that's what we're trying to do to equip us uh, for this. Last conversation with the person next to you or personal reflection and uh, join the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat if you guys are joining us online. With the person next to you, which of these points do you feel like you need to hear at this point in your spiritual or career journey? Go ahead. Okay, let's come back together, everyone. <laughs> and I want to encourage us to continue having these kinds of conversations. These are... This is the kind of conversation community that I, I'd love for our church to become and step into more and more. So to close, friends, you know, in, for us to fulfill the mission of our church, we're going to all have to be on this journey of self-knowledge, self-acceptance, and self-gift. And, and the reason is because God has called us to engage and be present to a world that is deeply hurting and is deeply broken. And if we are to follow Jesus' footsteps and become love embodied in this broken and painful world, this journey, my friends, is going to cause us pain. Right? Pain is going to be inevitable. Right? So I'm not going to say this thing, like if you follow Jesus, he's going to take all your pain away and everything's going to work out great. It's actually probably the opposite. If you're following Jesus, you're actually walking into pain. Right? That's, that's the life that Jesus walked into. And because pain is going to be inevitable, we need self-knowledge. We need self-acceptance in our self-gift. So let us pursue these things so that we can be resilient to this pain, so that we can support each other in this pain, so that we can all grow stronger because of it and walk even closer with each other and with Jesus, so that we can give ourselves more fully to our Lord to our neighborhood, and to our world altogether. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, the modeling that you gave for us. As uh, 
when we, when we reflect on the life of Jesus, which was a life of self-gifts, where Jesus gave himself to the degree and to the extent where he died on the cross for our sin, knowing fully who he was as the Son of God and the Son of Man. And following your example of love embodied, Lord, I pray that you can build us up as a community that pursues together self-knowledge, self-acceptance, and self-gift so that we can be present as you were to this broken world, to suffer alongside it, and to heal and care and redeem it in the name of Jesus. Amen.